A freemium business only makes sense if there's a reason to have a free plan. Today, we're speaking with Michelle Zatlin, the COO and co-founder of the cybersecurity company Cloudflare. Michelle and her co-founders built Cloudflare from the ground up during a recession. There weren't a lot of jobs in a tough economic environment. Rest in peace startups. It's all about revenue and conserving cash. So it was not frothy. Very similar today. Different but similar. We had nothing to lose. Only female founder running a publicly listed company valued over $20 billion. You like, gotta keep yourself on the field. You gotta keep yourself in the game. And in our conversation, we discuss how to know when you fit product market fit, the strategies that they've used to build a massive B2B startup in the early days, and also the incredible stories around moving to Silicon Valley and building a massive multi-billion dollar company. So please welcome to the podcast, Michelle Zatland. The first question that we ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? Uh, it's a good story. I feel like my story of how I founded Cloudflare is a bit of made for TV material. So I met my business partners, Matthew Prince and Lee Holloway, 12 years ago. I was doing my MBA at Harvard Business School. And really, uh, Matthew and Lee had done something before that helped understand cybersecurity needs for small businesses. They knew a lot about um, how if you were a small business, you didn't have a lot of protection online. And we had a little bit of a conversation that went like this, Nathan, where Matthew kept talking about this thing called Project Honeypot. And I said, Matthew, what is it? He's like, Project Honeypot tracks bad behavior online for webmasters, IT administrators, bloggers around the world. And I said, and how many people signed up for Project Honeypot? He said, 80,000. And I said, Nathan, I, Nathan, I said, Matthew, 80,000, that's a lot. How do they hear about Project Honeypot? He's like, word of mouth. And I said, okay, what do you get for being part of Project Honeypot? And it turns out you got karma points. You put honeypots on your site to track malicious behavior and you got karma points, like on a leaderboard. I said, karma points? He's like, yeah, you helped catch a new bad guy and you got, um, you got rewarded for that in a leaderboard. And I kept saying, okay, and then what does Project Honeypot do with the data? He's like, well, we work with we, we go work with law enforcement agencies and we go back and we go find the offenders to get them offline. Doesn't that take a long time? He goes, yes, years. To which I was like, why does anyone sign up for this service? And this is how I got my job. In that moment, Nathan, Matthew said to me, he kind of got frustrated, he threw up his hands and he said, Michelle, one day we want to use the threat data to create a service that actually stops malicious behavior online and helps make the internet faster and more reliable, regardless of what size you are. And fast forward to today, that's exactly what Cloudflare does. If you are putting anything on the internet, if you're a small business owner or a blogger, if you run an application, an API, or you are one of the global 2000 businesses, anything connected to the internet uses Cloudflare. We help make sure you're protected from online malicious behavior. We help make sure you're fast and reliable. And it all started from this exchange in the hallway 12 years ago. Yeah, that's a crazy story. So. Um... I was saying offline, we're a customer, love the so love love the software, love the service. Um, I'm curious, so, so how did you guys get started building this product? Did you go out and raise money? Did you bootstrap it? How did you get product market fit or proof of concept? Talk us through that. For sure. So we had this insight and you never know. I mean, opportunities present themselves all the time. As a founder, you see them, you're really good at spotting the opportunities. Not all of them are good. And so... Uh, we as good business school students kind of went and did some homework, Nathan. So step one was, is there an actual problem here? And the way that we validated that is we actually did a survey. Sounds silly, sounds super old school, but man, was that very, very effective where we surveyed a lot of small business owners who had online presences and we just asked, hey, how much do you care about um, these malicious bots and bad, bad behavior coming to your site? And we had a bunch, we had kind of a quantitative section, but it was the qualitative section that was the real eye opener. The answers, Nathan, ended up being uh, quotes like, uh, web spammers are the scourge of the internet. Oh, interesting. Web spammers are criminals and should be in jail. Very visceral. And here, I, I still remember this like it was yesterday, even though this is, you know, 12 years ago or 13 years ago at this point, a long time ago at this point, web spammers make me believe in the death penalty. Oh, wow. And so 
you know, you just think of that as a founder. I mean, again, early stage founder trying to validate, is there something here? I mean, that visceral reaction, it just was so strong. So that was kind of a data point one. Then the second part of the survey, we asked a lot around, okay, well, how do you solve this issue? If you think it's a problem, how do you solve it today? It was super interesting. Back when we did this back in uh, January of 2009, there were not good solutions. It was there. Everyone was doing something different. All these small businesses were using Band-Aid solutions, homegrown, not very effective. And so the big insight for us was, wow, could we create technology? Could we build a product using tech to solve this problem? And back in the day, there's a bunch of shifts. It was a world where big companies so- solved this problem by a bunch of hardware, but this rise of the cloud was happening, the rise of machine learning, the rise of mobile. A lot of trends were happening at the time. And so it created this opportunity for us to create a service that delivered performance, security, and reliability. And it was actually some just those insights early on where we said, hey, we're going to be a service, which makes it easy to use. Anyone can sign up around the world to use this service. And those were some of the original kind of data points that we used to gain traction. And so and as we started to talk to investors and to employees to try and hire People always always ask, okay, well, what's the problem? We kind of could go back to these really strong quotes. It was very visceral. It was like, wow, there's clearly a problem here. And we came up with a clever technical solution to help solve it. And there was a lot of people early on said, I'm not sure if it's going to work, but if it does, it's going to be a big company. And so they kind of bet on that. And we spent a lot of time making sure it worked. And those initial customers got a lot of benefit out of Cloudflare. And so those are some of the initial things that really worked well for us was this clear problem, coming up with a small, clever technical solution, and then working really, really hard to make sure that it worked and had real ROI for our customers. And what point did you move to Silicon Valley? Is that where you, did you move to Silicon Valley to raise your seed round? Because you've been quoted that, you were a nobody when you first moved there. I'd love to hear about that journey and, and what that felt like as well. Yeah, I think somebody once said, Michelle, stop saying that. Tell me you're just like a regular a regular person. I was like, well, it kind of wasn't nobody when I showed up here. I'll tell you that. But but I guess um, it doesn't look shed very nice and light on us. So, so we started to make progress. We're like, wow, there's a problem. We thought we came up with an interesting technical solution. And we're like, okay, let's see if we can build this. And the question is, where do you start your company? In today's world, everything is so distributed. But back in 2009, that wasn't the case. And uh, there was a big cybersecurity community in Atlanta. There was a lot going on in Boston. That's where we lived. But we picked Silicon Valley for two reasons. One, we needed access to capital. We knew that if we were going to do what we needed to do, we needed a lot to raise a lot of capital. And at the time, this was the best place to do that. And then the second reason was we also needed access to technical talent who could work at internet scale. And what I mean by that is we the way that Cloudflare does what we do and from day one was we had this vision to build this globally distributed network that was going to have a lot of traffic coming through us. And you say if the traffic is malicious, you stop it for everyone. If it's Nathan coming to, to any of your sites to check out this cool startup, you make the experience better for any um, legitimate visitor. And we knew we had to be everywhere to do that. And and so knowing that we need to under have, be able to hire engineers and go-to-market talent that could work at scale, at the time, the Valley was the best place to do it. This is where a lot of the giants had come from before. And that's why we packed up our bags. And Matthew and his mother, my business partner and his mother, literally drove a U-Haul from Boston to San Francisco. Now, that's like 6,000 miles. It's far. That's like a, a week's long drive. Uh, and we showed up here in the summer of 2009, really not knowing anyone. And we were just these ambitious, eager students saying, hey, we have this idea to help make the internet better. And a lot of people are like, who are you? <laughs> like, like, where did you come from? Like, who do you know? And this was not, you know, we did not have a lot of contacts. We did not want to have a lot of folks. I certainly did not have a well-to-do uncle that lived here who introduced us to everyone we didn't have any of that we kind of showed up here uh, with this heart try to win over the hearts and minds and, and say hey we have this idea and give us a chance to make it happen and i think that silicon valley is not perfect but i do think it's still the best place in the world to come show up and and with an idea and smarts to to mail to some hearts and guts and smarts and luck 
still the best place in the world to start a company to be able to make it happen. Hmm. Can you talk us through, I'd love to delve a little deeper. So you rocked up, uh, didn't know anybody. Like who, who, who was the first connection? How did you meet your first investor? Talk us through that, right? Because like you guys now uh, are listed $20 billion market cap. It's an incredible story. It is, again, made for TV story, Nathan. Um, so it's interesting. It's, you know, I, I really mean this uh, for all the early stage founders. And I still feel like this today. And today, Cloudflare is, we have a billion in revenue. We did $975 million in U.S. dollars last year in revenue. We passed a billion in revenue run rate. We have um, 162,000 paying customers around the world, over 4 million customers around the world. We have both a free and a paying service. And we have about 3,200 people that work for our company. So that's like a lot. And I still feel like this to this day. And it happened a lot when we were three of us, the three founders started. I really believe that one conversation can change everything. It's like one conversation can really have an outsized impact on on outcomes um, for early stage founders. So when we showed up here. It was interesting. We had a couple, I don't know, things opportunity that we made happen. So um, you know, I skipped over some of the stories, but when we were at doing our MBAs, we had we were doing the business plan competition. That was part of the way that we made progress on this idea. It was a great cover. It was kind of like, hey, we made progress as students. I didn't have to quit a job. I was a student. We made a lot of progress on our business plan. We entered the Harvard Business School business plan competition and we ended up winning, which was, you know, not a reason to start a company, but it certainly helps to have a feather in your cap. It's just another accolade that you could use to open a door. And one of the judges of that competition was a VC, Highland Capital, and they were based in Boston and they came and said, hey, why don't you come, you know, work out of our offices this summer? And and it, it, I like I remember this conversation was like yesterday. One of the associates, junior associates, said, hey, I really wish you had applied for the EIR program. We were like, what's that? And he said, oh, it's the entrepreneurship program where we have entrepreneurs come and work out of our office and, and get mentorship. And it was interesting. We kind of went home that night. We sent a note. We called the partner saying, hey, we want to be part of that program and we want to do it in the Valley. And it was all of a sudden they had to go and talk internally, but it, guess what? Next thing I knew, we were part of the program in Silicon Valley. And so it gave us a reason to be out here. So we were out here. And again, that's not the reason why Cloudflare is successful, but it help, does help give you legitimacy. It helps you with your own psyche because when you're early on, you have a lot of conviction, but there's lots of things that go wrong, a lot of friction every single day. And to be able to tell my mom and my dad, hey, I'm working out of a real VC firm's office over the summer was helpful. Um, helped us with telling that to friends, helped us as we were talking to other folks. So that was something we did. We also really focused on building the product and getting a pilot up and running. So we had real life data on metrics, on traction. And I always like to remind uh, founders, you want to be really good storytellers. Don't be such a good storyteller that you're a fraud. You'll get yourself in trouble. We've seen some founders get themselves in a lot of trouble because they were frauds. So don't be that, but be a good storyteller to bring people along, paint the vision. And if you can back it up with data and traction, that is a really great place to be. And so we were really hard at work at building a pilot and getting early stage customers. And I mean, customers in the most broadest terms. I mean, they weren't paying us anything. Some of them were our friends. Yes, some we were begging to try it. But it was data points of people using our service and getting value from it so that we could then use that to help have data back up our story of what we are working on. And I would, um, and a really, really compelling working demo. And so those sorts of things really mattered a lot in the early days. And then just, we showed up here and this is back to like one conversation can change everything. So now we're working a part of a VC firm's EIR gives us more legitimacy. There's three of us working on it. So we had founders better than one person. There's three of us who were not, we did not have full-time jobs. We were doing this full-time jobs. And a friend from school who was Bulgarian, her childhood friend happened to be a cybersecurity investor. And she said, hey, I really want to introduce you to my childhood friend who lives in the Valley. We said, okay, her name's Dafina Toncheva. We met her for a lemonade in the Valley. And she told her our, our vision. And she really knew a lot about the problem space and thought that our technical solution was super interesting. And that we were taking this really seriously. And after that lemonade, she invited us in to meet her partner. And the first time we met that venture partner, he wanted to write a check for us. 
He's like, I'll, I can write a check for you right now. I'm authorized to write up to an X dollar, $500,000 check without checking with my partnership. And um, it was interesting. Matthew looked at me and I said, no, that's not enough. We need more money than that. And again, this was back in the day. Today, $500,000, people are laughing on the phone, thinking, listening to this. But back in the day, that was a lot of money for us. And so we um, went back and pitched his partnership and ended up raising about $2 million, which again, seems like nothing today. But back then, that was a lot of money for a couple of not well-known folks who showed up in the Valley to, to give it a go. But it was, again, one fr fr student, call one of our classmates, childhood friends, who happened to be the right person. And so back to one conversation can have huge outsized um, impact on what you're doing. So while I know lots of busy people say, say no to most things, I also think there's some value in saying yes to some things too. Mm, what a great story. And I have to ask you, right? Like this was 12, 13 years ago and this was during the middle of a recession. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a kind of, insatiable economic climate you know some some uncertainty right now i'm curious what advice would you give to founders looking to start a company like right now during these times yeah i like to say it was not frothy when we started cloudflare um you know a lot of classmates at harvard were not getting offers or the offers they were it kind of i saw a headline actually last week where some of the big consulting firms were paying people to go and take a six month vacation um, before they kind of uh, have a chance to extend before they started their work and pay them to go on vacation, basically. And the same thing was happening back in 2009, where it just was there weren't a lot of jobs. It was a tough economic environment. And if you go back, I mean, VCs were issuing uh memos around like rest in peace startups it's all about revenue and conserving cash so it was not frothy very similar today different but similar and i mean on one side we were we had nothing to lose like really like i was coming out of business school i'd been a student i wasn't it hadn't been working i didn't have a great job i had to quit like it was in many ways we were really lucky um i did get a jo another job offer after school that i was supposed to go pursue but i i feel like when you're not working, it's easier to choose between do I go take this real offer and go pursue the startup versus having to actually quit a job to pursue something that's super risky. And um and so it was it was not a frothy time. But we also just like our expenses were already low. We're kind of a time in our life where you can do this sort of thing. You know, I look back today and I think I can't believe I did that. Like it was kind of crazy to move to a new state, a new city where I knew no one to give this a go with people like I didn't even know that well. But but to, to say, let's see where it leads and have the faith in yourself. Uh, but yes, it was it was um, definitely not frothy. I guess a couple things that I feel like worked really well for us that maybe will be helpful to some of the founders um, listening to here. I, I, mean, I go back to those survey results and the fact that there was such a visual reaction from these business owners, these you know bloggers, these creators, folks in IT of just like, this is a real problem for me and I have no good solution. I mean, I came back to that over and over again. It gives you validation that you're solving a real meaningful problem. And it turns out when you're solving a real meaningful problem, other people want to get a part of that. I, like I just, it, even in bad times, it almost gives you more, people are looking for meaningful work and they want to be part of something that's meaningful. And I like, I just think, wow, that was really um, helpful to us early on. The second thing I will say is because it was tough times, we didn't raise a lot of money. There was not a lot of hype. We were not hype worthy founders. Like we just weren't. And and we took every capital dollar that we raised and we took it really we treated it with with um, a lot of care. We were very good stewards of capital and meaning that we really did not spend our way out of any problem. We engineered our way out of problems. We used a lot of grit. And you can actually do a lot. You can be super frugal and get a long way to prove out an idea and get traction. And then you end up, end up spending a lot of money and it becomes easier. But I would say that constraint of not having a lot of money because it was a tough time actually ended up benefiting us for years and years to come. Um, and and so I think like that's the other silver lining. If you have huge conviction, doing something really meaningful and you can kind of be really gritty about making progress, you actually end up being in a better company long term, even though it's really hard at the moment. And so 
those are some of the insights I have. We ended up raising that $2 million just to give everyone a cent. We were the only tech investment Venrock did that whole year. They just didn't invest in any other tech companies except for Cloudflare that one round. So it was like a very hard time to be raising capital. And But we were the exception to the story. And so if you have the conviction, you're solving a meaningful problem, you're making traction, take the capital you ra- raise and be good stewards. Um, and we really, I mean, we were very serious about all those things. Mm. And during that time, I think... Uh... You know, there was a lot of fear and uh, there was a kind of, because uh, I remember during that time, I just started my first uh, professional job. I just remember I started my first professional job and I got a salary of $28,000 annually. And uh, that, I remember the HR person said to me, yeah, it's a good starting salary, especially during these economic times. So there, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of uncertainty and it's similar to now, but I guess the common thread is, this naivety, like a lot of these incredible stories, like it's kind of like, you know, let's just go for it. Don't really know what's going to happen, but what's the worst that can happen? Well, actually, you know, it's interesting. I think, um, again, I, I, so just to all the founders listening, or if you are at a high growth, if you're at a founding team of a growth company, there are, there's lots of ways to be successful. And, you know, you talk to a hundred successful founders, you will get hundred different ways. And that's why I think these sorts of conversations are so helpful, Nathan. But as I've met a lot of entrepreneurs, there are definitely some entrepreneurs who are like only going to be an entrepreneur and there's nothing else that they're doing. They are searching for our ideas and they're never going to work for anyone else. I was not that person. Like I really, I kind of spotted an opportunity and I fell more and more in love with it every day. And, and that was Cloudflare and became Cloudflare. And I'm so glad and fortunate and grateful that that opportunity presented itself and that I went for it. Lots of people, lots of, lots of ways that I could have not gone for it. But it was interesting. I had a job offer. I had a really good job offer from a really great company. It was LinkedIn. They were still private. They were growing like a rocket ship. And I remember going to see the the person who had hired me, who who's still there to this day. So again, I think this would have been a good outcome if I had I gone to LinkedIn. And I said to this person, I said, hey, look, I'm so excited about this offer, but I want to go. I have this idea that I started to work on at school and it's getting a lot of traction and I got to go see if I can make it happen. And Nathan, he looked me straight in the eye in the, in the LinkedIn cafeteria and said, you are making the biggest mistake of your life. Because that was a rocket ship. He was offering me a ride on the rocket ship. And and those don't come around. And he knew he was at a rocket ship. And again, that LinkedIn was a rocket ship. It ended up doing great things. And I was so grateful and to walk away. And and I said, I thought to myself, you're probably right, but I got to see. I got to see where it goes. Back to this little bit of naivety, the time in life where I, I have to see where it goes. And I remember saying to him, I said, look, I have to see where this goes. I could never live with myself if I don't. And if it doesn't go anywhere, I hope I can come back to you. Maybe you'll consider to hire me. Because it wasn't like I was going to a competitor or another growth company. It's like a totally different sort of thing. And again, I sometimes I look back and I think I can't believe I had the conviction to do that. I, you know, I, you know, now it seems obvious in the moment it, it wasn't. And again, I think I had two good options to choose from. Um, but, you know, I, again, I think as these, if you're a founder, you're not sure. That's okay. I mean, to me, that's okay. It's, you're never really sure. And sometimes you just got to go for it. And, and what I kept coming back to were, you know, again, I talked about these survey results, but then as we started to have customers on board to the service, I'm just like these were validation points for me. The data, we had no revenue, the data was not there, but these were the sorts of validation points I had along the way where we, you know, we were building the first iteration of our product. And just like probably, hopefully, some, or not hopefully, just like maybe some of you who are listening, it was took us longer and it cost us more. You know, we had a deadline to hit and we missed it. And, and and we are like trying to get this demo out or sorry, the pilot out and open it up. And we we're trying to get to 100 customers. And I just remember and everyone was kept saying, well, this isn't the analytics are done. And finally, we're like, just ship it, ship it, ship the MVP. We have much more language as startup founders today. But back then it was like whole all the stuff was all very new. So we shipped it and we didn't we were so embarrassed what we shipped. I mean, very embarrassed. We were fighting a lot internally. There was about six of us at the time about whether it was ready or not. Just ship it. 
and people signed up for it. And and I'm not an engineer, but I, I actually called a lot of these initial employees and I did all these, um, sorry, initial customers, not employees. And I did uh, like Skype interviews with them and recorded them to get kind of the voice of the customer feedback. And what was amazing was these customers who had signed up for this product that I was really like very embarrassed about were writing in saying, oh my God, your your product state yeah, stopped all the trash traffic coming to my site. It offloaded all the bots coming to my server that I actually, for the first time in five years, my pager didn't go off last night. I actually had a full, full night's sleep for the first time in five years. What was so interesting is customers didn't even need the analytics that the, the product was so good at stopping the, the bots and the search engine traffic and all these crawlers and all this hidden things that none of us see on a daily basis that if you run a website or app have to deal with, it, it was stopping that, that all of these initial customers who are technical and could see it themselves were so happy. And there's just so many points along the way where we had customers writing in saying, oh my God, you saved this or you did this for me or thank you so much because they felt like they were alone and all of a sudden they had an ally of w- in what we were building with Cloudflare. We were supercharging their site, supercharging their online presences and it was creating a lot of joy for them and that's what I kept coming back to and even though our revenue metrics were low when you're charging $20 a month and $250 a month you don't grow your revenue very fast we had these kind of qualitative data points um, that gave me a lot of validation that I'd made the right choice that we were working on the right things and then over time I was like okay we're solving a real meaningful problem. And then it's like, and then at some point, a few years, and I was like, wow, we have a real business model here too. This is going to be a great business. And so I think you can fall more and more in love with your idea over time too. Mm, yeah. Thank you for sharing. That was a crazy story. Thank you. That was gold. Um, did you guys launch with freemium? We did. We launched at, uh, again, back to some nostalgia. We launched at a conference called TechCrunch Disrupt. At the time, I thought of it as gold standard. And again, we were not, didn't have a, I did not have a Twitter following. In fact, Twitter was a brand new service at the day. And, you know, today would be maybe different. But back then, no media company, no podcast, found, no podcaster wanted us to have us on our show. So we we entered this pitch competition, TechCrunch Disrupt. And when we stepped on stage, we had a free service, um, a $20 a month service that's now $25 a month. We just raised our prices last, uh, in December. And, um, and then we had a... Um, Call us if you're interested in enterprise. That's what we launched with. And today we have a we have more. We have a two hundred fifty dollar month service, and we have uh, kind of a fifty to a hundred thousand dollar service, and then a million hundred thousand dollar plus, million dollar plus, ten million dollar plus service. When we started, it was free twenty five twenty dollars a month. And call us if you want to be part of our enterprise advisory board. <laughs> there you go. That's crazy. And why did you guys decide to launch with a freemium model? Uh, and that inherently allowed you guys to really get strong product-led growth yeah it's interesting so product-led growth um again in some ways nathan i'm I'm, i feel like i'm a dinosaur being on the show because i'm so you know i run a publicly traded company real revenue and just so many things are different today like where back when we launched product-led growth was not a term (laughs) i feel like a dinosaur saying that but it's true so there you go and and, and today it is, and there's a lot more understanding about these go-to-market models, of which we absolutely have one of those. So I'm very proud of that. Um, okay, so a couple things I'll say. Um, and, and this is Michelle Michelle's view of the world, and there's probably lots of folks who, who are much smarter about it today because what they do all day long. But here's my, my take. A freemium business only makes sense if there's a reason to have a free plan. And, and one of the reasons can be because sometimes they convert to pay you. But it's much better if there's more than than just that reason, okay? And so at Cloudflow, there's actually six reasons why we have a free plan. There are six good business reasons that make our business better because we off, we service everyone. And I can articulate it much better today than I can at the beginning, but we did have a sense of we needed traffic using our service because we were the way that we were going to deliver this performance security and reliability for our customers is we had to build something called a global network. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but to build a global network, it costs money, but you also need internet traffic. And so one of the ways that we were going to get internet traffic to be able to do that, because I don't didn't think Disney was going to buy from Matthew and Michelle on day one, was we federated together 
all of the small businesses and the blogs and the small websites that nobody was focusing on. And this is actually was a very deliberate distribution strategy. We are very deliberate about it. It's Clay Christensen called the innovator's dilemma. Like there's actually like some business strategy behind why we did this. And it was very effective. And so if you're saying, hey, I, traffic is helpful to our business model. How do you get traffic? We said, hey, we want to federate together everybody, the long tail of the internet. I don't really like calling it the long tail because if you're a small business owner, you run an IT administration shop, you don't feel like you're the long tail of the internet. I always felt like that was a disservice. But these um, freelancers, small business owners, they had nothing. Nobody else was servicing them. And so we said, hey, let's make sure we can capture that part of the market. And so for when we launched, it was give us five minutes and we'll supercharge your site. It took us less than five minutes to sign up for our service. And we had a free service offering and a $20 a month service offering. And overnight, Nathan, we disrupted the market. We opened up what was possible. We launched on stage at TechCrunch Disrupt. And our audience were all technical folks in the audience. All those people had blogs or small businesses. A bunch of them signed up. And it's interesting. I don't have a graph here. But literally, our numbers have been up and to the right ever since the day we launched. They've never stopped growing. And part of it is it was so easy to sign up, less than five minutes. And just by comparison, if you went to a, 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 like a competitor at the day, it, the average time to sign up was six weeks. To go from six weeks to five minutes is just like, that's like magic. And so we did some really smart things to help service this large audience with this free freemium plan. And so back to the, the insight of the product-led growth is, Yes, some of our free customers end up paying us. We're very grateful. Some of our free customers never pay us, but they bring us to work. Happens a lot today where they use us on their personal sites, uh, their personal blog, or they just want to keep their tech skills sharp. But then at work, their 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 employer is thinking about using Cloudflare and Enterprise version, and they you know, spend a million dollars a year, and they're part of the decision-making process. That's two of the reasons there's a revenue, but the other four reasons have nothing to do with them paying us. It has to do with things helping to build our our, um, our our global network around the world has to do with helping us build better products because we have better cyber data and better performance data around the world. No one else has that. No, none of the enterprise only companies have that because they don't have a free service. Uh, helps us with QA when we, we're very consumer-like, even though we're a B2B company where we can roll out a new service to all of our free customers learn, make sure the product works, and then we roll it out to our enterprise customers. And we can say it's totally battle tested, which is what Google and Facebook does. They take 1% of their traffic, make sure it works, and they roll it out to everyone. We use that same sort of me mechanism. And so we don't have to staff a QA team because we can use um, our network to be able to do that, our customer segments to do that. And then it also is a great recruiting. I was I was spending time with our a new hire class this morning. We have a bunch of new folks that joined. And I asked that how many of you used Cloudflare personally before you applied to work here? Over half of them. And if we only sold to large enterprises, you know, at a million dollars a year, that's we hundred thousand dollars a year, we can do that today. A lot of those engineers would never have us on their personal site. And so we have six reasons why we have a free service. And when I think entrepreneurs get into trouble is when there's only one reason they have a free service. They think it's a marketing ploy and some of them pay pay you. And that that that's pretty well understood of how that works. You time box the trial, you do all these sorts of things. But it's really good if you can figure out other business reasons why you need that free service that helps make your business model better. I think that's super interesting. Mm, yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for sharing. Um, you talked about B2B. I'd love to hear your take on founders that are you know, building a B2B SaaS or B2B software company or B2B service. Um, you know, what, what are some common mistakes you see founders making in the early stages when it comes to, I guess, finding their first users, winning their first few deals? I mean, okay, so first of all, being a startup founder is so hard, especially early, so so, so keep at it. Uh, I think if you work on something meaningful that you got purpose around, that, that really helps. So a couple things that maybe things I, gray hair or scar tissue I have that hopefully will pass on to others. So things I would do again, ease of use. Again, we obsessed over our sign-up process and, and literally it took less than five minutes to onboard to Cloudflare. But that didn't just happen. That wasn't easy. Like it was a lot of engineering work on the back end and UI work to make that happen a lot. 
um, a lot of toiling over the details. But like that ease of use was a huge differentiation early on for customer acquisition because we didn't lose people because of that. And so people who really weren't set up for Cloudflare could. And I just think like obsessing over that, I would definitely do again. The other thing I would do again, and then I'll tell you the things I wouldn't do again or things, mistakes I see others make, including myself, um, is it's interesting. You're a founder. You can have a personality. And for some of you, that'll be really great. For some of you others, it'll be very hard. But for those who can, you should. It becomes a differentiation. And so have a Twitter account, have be on Discord, you know, do your LinkedIn and update and talk about the industry or things or whatnot. You'll develop a following. You'll get invited on panels, podcasts, you'll get invited to speak. And all of a sudden you you seem your company seems bigger than it is. And that gives validation. People are talk other people start to talk about you. It's easier to recruit. It's all these sorts of things. Um, and so I think that that was something, and we were lucky. It was right when Twitter was starting. Matthew was on it. I was on it. We ended up, you know, we we went to a couple startup things, speaking. Once you do one, you get invited to others because your name's on the schedule and other people who are planning something else. Just look up the speakers from that and invite you. And again, you do some of that and it makes you feel seem bigger than you are. People hear about your service. They sign up. They apply to work for you. All these sorts of things where you can have that. It's interesting. Today, I'm a publicly traded company. I, you know, I'm executive officer. But like what you can say publicly is so different than when you're a private company. You have a lot more of a personality and and um and so kind of use that to your advantage. So I think that that without without being a jerk in my opinion, but you can let your personality um come through. And then the the and just all the things that come along with that for your business. And the third thing I would definitely do again is we started a company blog very early on. And at first it was very marketing focused and no one read it. And then we started to write really technical blogs. And again, we built infrastructure for the internet. We're a super geeky technical company. I mean, yesterday we stopped 136 billion cyber attacks. Like we're literally building infrastructure for the internet that helps provide privacy, security, and performance and reliability. It's plumbing for the internet. Turns out plumbing is really important. And so we started to write blog posts that would talk about like, hey, here's our technical problem. Here's what we did. And all of a sudden, Nathan, we had huge read like followership and readership around the world and so to this day like our blog gets it's 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 read more than most media properties it gets a lot of views because we're talking about interesting things related to cloudflare and the internet and cybersecurity performance and how the internet works and all these things that are important to cloudflare but it turns out we become experts on and and it's not me writing the blog. It's like our engineers and it's our product managers. And what's interesting is people start to read and they're like, can I play it? They apply to work for you. And they say, hey, can I write a blog post for the blog? And we're like, yes, please. And it became this like huge flywheel for us because early on, it's hard to hire people. Well, we found it was hard to hire people because again, we didn't have a reputation. No one wanted to come to work for Matthew and Michelle. So we had to work really hard to hire. And that was one way to make it easier. So those are some things I would do again. Some things that I absolutely wish I um I had avoided uh, that maybe will will be helpful to to these folks. Um, you know, look, people are everything. Relationships are everything, and and you, and I think early on there were some folks that left Cloudflare, and I was I took it really personally. It's really hard not to. You start this company, you put your blood, sweat, and tears in. You're working so hard. And people left, and especially if it surprised us, me, I took that really hard. And I just, I wish I hadn't. And, you know, I think now taking the high road, I think, is a better approach. They end up being customers, end up referring you. They end up referring other people to work for you as you are successful. And so just saying thank you for your contributions. I wish you all the best in your next chapter and, like, moving past it is for me a much healthier way to deal with it and early on I, I took it a lot more personally and you know you hear these stories about Michael Bloomberg I mean I don't know if this is true where he's like if you quit Bloomberg you're blacklisted from me I just don't think that works in this day and age or it didn't work for me so so that's like one thing that I would do differently the second thing and I really took this personally as well I cared so much we had such good intentions and I'll just tell you a story I went to a dinner I went to a dinner that Goldman, Goldman Sachs invited me to. 
Good. And it was awesome. They thought they were doing me a favor. You know, again, you're trying to have legitimacy as an early stage founder. So they might meet to this dinner and they sent me next to a famous founder. Okay. And they think they're doing me a favor, which is great. And I'm excited. I'm like there. I'm excited about what we're doing a cloud form. I'm excited. But I'm not going to say who it was, but a very famous founder. You would all know him if I said his name. And I was telling him about Cloudflare and he was like grilling me. That's fine. Grill me. But he didn't believe anything I said. Not one thing. He didn't believe anything I said. And at some point I got like, I, I, I did take it personally. And I said, you're calling me a liar. And you can imagine this person did not take that very well when I said that. Because everything I said, he's like, that's impossible. I'm like, it's not. We're doing it. You, you got to check your assumptions. And it was this really awful thing. And so I left that dinner not feeling good. But I, in the power dynamics of that relationship, he had all the power. So there's nothing to do about it. It was fine. And again, not not that that hurt Cluffer, but every time we saw each other in an event, it was awkward. Everything. And all of a sudden, you had someone who wasn't a champion for us. And in the end, we ended up clearing the air and it's fine. But I tell that story because especially early on, there's going to be a lot of people who don't believe you, who are going to be in disbelief. And I took that personally. There's a lot of people who I wanted to hire. They're like, I'm not going to come work for you. And they would say it like that. And you're like, this is not like, call me when it's real. And you're just like, okay, thanks. Um, And, and I think that there's like, okay, absolutely. I'll call you when it's real. No problem. I'm going to, I'm going to win you over versus you suck. And so I think don't, don't, don't burn bridges even when you feel like someone else is in the wrong, because you might need that person is the other thing that I would say that I have some scar tissue over and I've gotten a lot better at. And and I see that sometimes today. It's like, you don't need the validation. You don't need to win them over. Just everyone comes along around at some point and your job is to keep winning on the field, gaining progress, gain, gain ground against your idea, find the people who do want to believe and be championed and spend your time on that. And you'll be much happier and productive for it. And but don't don't burn all the other bridges because at some point they're you're gonna need them or they're gonna come along. Yeah, wow, what a great story. You're you're good. Thank you for sharing. That's a good I wish you'd I tell me the person. <laughs> I've died to know the person, but I, I respect you. We want, you know, we want to be respectful. Uh okay. All right. Well look, um a couple more questions and then we'll work towards wrapping up. Um being a female founder of a publicly listed company, um, do you ever feel lonely? I have, do I ever feel lonely? I mean, do you want the half glass full or the half glass empty answer? Because I, I think that that's maybe the, 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 the realistic answer. I don't, I mean, how about a, 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 I'm an optimistic person. So there are definitely more men than women in tech. Having said that, there's a lot of amazing women, and I don't even know all of them. There's so many of us. So there's like a lot of amazing women in technology. There's a lot of women, amazing women founders, and we need more. And by the way, what we really need more of also are underrepresented minorities. It's like a great industry. It's a great place to grow your career. Like, I want more. We have a lot, and we need way more. So let me start with that. Um, And I feel like on a daily basis at Cloudflare, I get treated great. And there's a bunch of people like I've created a world where I'm treated like Michelle and doesn't matter whether I'm woman or man. In fact, it's probably a benefit that I'm a woman and like people work at Cloudflare because of that and they buy from us because of that. And and like I show up every single day and it's awesome. I have great business partners and shareholders and investors. And and so I don't like I love all of that. So I so I guess that's the positive side. You know, the downside is, you know, the, the numbers are just so depressing. You want to throw your computer out the window. And that's all true. And while my experience has been mostly positive, and I got lots of bad stories there too. So don't, I don't want to paint this. I got lots of annoying stories many times along the way at all stages, including, you know, three weeks ago. But um, the, the, like, the numbers are just so depressing. And you just think, like, what are we going to do to move the needle on this? And it's, like, a really hard problem. And that can be discouraging. And so that's the half glass full, half glass empty. I I don't feel lonely. Like, I love I love what I get to do. I think there's I know lots of great women and we, I want more. But, like, the numbers are bad and they're not moving fast enough. And so we got a lot of work to do. And, you know, I think that's up to every single person to be able to influence that. And one of the things that I 
said to myself a lot along the way, especially like on the dark days is you like got to keep yourself on the field. You got to keep yourself in the game because it, like to me, that was really important. And so I feel I'm glad I did that and, and I want more. And so the more women, um, in the industry. And, uh, when, uh, when, uh, the, the PR, um, got in touch with us, uh, part of the pitch for you is you fly relatively under the radar. Uh, is that on purpose? Yeah, I is interesting. I um, having a conversation with someone yesterday where I said, "Hey, look, I like I I don't need to seek the the spotlight at all, and, but I'm happy. It's part of my job as you know the president and co-founder and CEO of Cloudflare. Um, as a woman running one of the largest publicly traded company, I, like I I feel like it's a res- it's part of my job." to be out there speaking and it was interesting the person who is a PR expert said to me honestly that's the best sweet spot to be I find that the folks who flock to the spotlight end up burning and crashing pretty fast and so I thought that was a nice thing to hear from a true professional and so you know Matthew who's my business partner he's not on the cover of business week he should be it's kind of what's in service of Cloudflare I'm willing to do that the other thing I'll just say, actually, I was interviewing somebody yesterday. We went on all. Uh, I was interviewing somebody. Um, we're looking for a chief people officer. So if anyone is looking for a chief people officer at a publicly traded company to go from one to five billion, email me. I'm I am hiring. So I was talking to a candidate, and and she said to me, "You know, people work at Cloudflare because you are a woman." And I said, "I do know that." And I think that if you'd asked me that 10 years ago, Nathan, as an early stage founder, I would have been really uncomfortable with that. But today I know that. And that's, I am a role model for people at Cloudflare and in the industry and other working moms and women. And, and I'm, I'm okay. And I'm getting more comfortable of saying that and admitting that and saying, great, I'm proud of that. And I want to do the best I can. Hmm. Oh, look, thank you for sharing. Um, we have to work towards wrapping up. We're going to do the hot seat round. Got four or five questions, rapid fire. And uh, we'll wrap there. This has been great. Um, we didn't talk about this, but uh, you're Canadian. So what makes Canadian entrepreneurs special? Probably the same that makes Australian founders special. Uh, 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 yes, I'm proudly Canadian. I live in San Francisco, but also proudly Canadian. You know, I do think... Uh, Mal- Malcolm Gladwell has some really good research around how being an outsider helps you be an entrepreneur because you got to see things differently. You got you to be okay with going against the grain. You got to be okay with being uncomfortable. I think that there's something around that. So I think it's more about being an outsider that has helped me be super successful. Plus, I grew up in a in a place in Canada that's called Saskatchewan. It's 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 a place where hard work is rewarded and relationships matter and you have a lot of great there's really long harsh winters and a lot of community and I feel like that's something that I've brought to our founding team at Cloudflare that's paid dividends but so that's that's more of the the Canadian side smart get things done don't complain a lot low drama proud of all those things too when did a negative moment transform into a motivator you got to make lemonade out of lemonade lemons all the time Nathan I feel like and, you know, without without you know lying to yourself, but there's like okay, lemonade out of lemons. Uh, you know, I do think you can't let a crisis go to waste. Crises suck. You let a customer down. You lose a key employee. You mess up. You miss a deadline. You lose a big contract. I mean, all these things will happen to you, and it'll be awful. It'll be awful. Um, you'll find fraud in your company. You'll be like, what? Like what? How is that possible? And I, I, and some have different degrees of difficulty. I, one of the things I've learned, I've gotten really good at, is like use the crisis to your favor to drive change. And so one of the, I, I work with an executive coach and we were talking about not this, but something else. And it was interesting. She has a formula. Change equals vision plus pain. And so when there's high pain, like in a crisis, great way to drive change or you have to have a lot of vision and bring people along and so i think that i I think of that equation a lot it's like vision plus pain equals change and so when there's a crisis don't let it go to waste drive the change you need in your organization because there's for sure something Mm, that's a good one last year cloudflare was named 
a top 100 most loved workplace by Newsweek. Why do you love working at Cloudflare? I was really proud of that one, Nathan, because I care a lot about that. Uh, you know, I want to win hard. I want to be a great place to work. I want people to be able to have the career of their lives at Cloudflare. And so I best part of my job are the people I get to work with. Like the people I work with, they're smart. They care. They sweep the details. They're not jerks. Like we really are trying to do the right thing for the most part. And I just love that. I love being on a team where people are rowing in the same direction. And the other best part of my job are our customers because they are rooting for our success. We help solve their problems. I was... um one of our customers did a case study recently where they were saying they had 36 million cyber attacks last year and all 36 million were stopped by Cloudflare. I mean, that's real value. We, you know, we make the internet faster for a lot of our customers. We help protect their employees and workloads and give them like, it all, like we're doing so much value. So our customers are rooting for our success. And, and I've worked at companies where that's not the case, where customers, you were just another vendor or they didn't care about you. And so for me... I love the people I get to work with. I love our mission to help build a better internet. And then our customers um, helping them with their business needs because the internet's becoming more important for every single business. And like if you're using the internet in your business, you need Cloudflare. And the fact that we're there every step of the way, helping them be a strategic partner, like I'm so proud of that. Awesome. Last question. And uh, I'm keen to hear your response for this one because I think it'll be interesting. Or maybe because you've you've... You probably met a lot of really, really interesting founders. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? So many people. Um, I mean, I'd love, I'd love that. Who wouldn't want to have dinner with like Oprah Winfrey? I mean, she's a woman, black woman. I mean, what she's built, it's amazing. So I guess Oprah. Can you make that happen, Nathan? I'm putting it out into the universe. Okay. All right. This is, let's make this happen, team. <laughs> Yeah, we were really close to interviewing her at one time and then it never happened, but we were really close at one stage. Long time ago actually. Well let's go let's, let's make that, that happen, Nathan, and let's have dinner yeah. together with her. <laughs> yeah, done. Awesome. Well look, uh Michelle, thank you so much for your time. That was incredible. Uh really enjoyed the conversation. A lot of wisdom, experience, incredible story. So thank you so much. Well, thanks so much for having me and I'm really all the best to all the founders listening to this call. I can't wait to see what you're bu you build and keep at it. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.